respected brothers and sisters, allow me to start off, as always, by bidding you the Islamic greeting of Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an entity that is not defined or limited to a description or a definition. He's boundless, He's limitless. However, out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave us, He shared with us some of His names and attributes for us to be able to connect with Him, for us to be able to derive some knowledge so we can reach Him better. Amongst one of His divine names is al batin the hidden one, the secret one. And this name is profound. Why? Because it has many different dimensions. One of the dimensions is that it reminds us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a secret from our full understanding and knowledge and comprehension. We will never be able to understand God fully. That's one. Number two, that God, we cannot limit Him to a physical presence. We cannot say God looks like this. Number three is the aspect that I want to focus on tonight. And that is God knows the inner states, the inner conditions, the inner thoughts, the inner attention of every single creation of His. This is where I want to focus on. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through observing His creation, He notices that some of His creation commit wrongdoings. They perform sins. They violate His commands. Instead of being angry and raged, like us human beings, He shows something absolutely amazing. You know what God does when He sees His servant sin? He overlooks their shortcomings and He covers their sins. And that is where the name As-Sattar is derived. What is As-Sattar? The concealer, the one who hides, the one who covers. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you find that our traditions of the Ahlul Bayt are rich with, ref with references to this. In Dua Al-Iftitah, what does uh, what do we say? Alhamdulillah alladhi yujibuni hina unadi. Praise be to Allah who answers me whenever I call him. And what? Wa yasturu alayya kullan wa ana a'si. And he covers and he hides my shortcomings. And what I do in return? I disobey him. Wa yu'adhimu al-ni'mata alayya fala ujazi. And he bestows upon me, he showers me with mercy big bounties. And what do I do in return? I do not even show him gratitude. That's one. Number two, Dua Alif, Dua Kumail, sorry. Allahumma mawlai kam min qabihin satartah. Oh Allah, oh my Lord, oh my master. How many ugly things that I've performed that you have covered. And on the other spectrum of things, what, does Allah, what, what do we say? Wa kam min thana'in jameelin lastu ahlan lahu nashartah. How many times Am I with things that I didn't perform? You're, you're spreading goodness about me and things that I didn't even perform. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the creator of ours. We never ponder about this. And you see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is not limited to this. He tries to protect the dignity of the most honorable of his creation, the human being, until his death. You know what the Holy Prophet says? If God conceals and covers and protects the person, his servant in this world, he will not expose him in the afterlife, in judgment day. Did we ever think about this? Not only this, Allah bestows and showers us with hidden and seen blessings and mercy. And he encourages us, he opens his door widely for us to repent. And you know what he says? You make a mistake? Okay, my servant, come to me. Not only will I forgive you, I'll erase your sin. Not only that I'll erase your sin, if you work hard, if you're righteous with your deeds, I'll replace your sins with, with good deeds, with hasanat. What kind of creator do we have? What kind of a merciful Lord are we blessed with in this existence? Now, this is how God treats us with our shortcomings and mistakes. Let's now shift to seeing how humans. On the individual level, you see that today, a lot of us, specifically the youth, not only commit sin, but they're proud of it. They have the ability to boast and show off their sins publicly through the use of social media, particularly. Go and look at how, how we are using Snapchat and Instagram and see what we are sharing. We're forgetting the fact that God says, 
كل كل امتي معافا الا المجاهرين God says all of my na- uh, sorry the holy prophet says all of my nation are well except those who publicly expose their sins and we do this with full pride that's one spectrum the other thing is collectively as a community unfortunately you see this across all communities we compete and fight to who wants to showcase the wrongdoings, the flaws, the problems of one another. We compete. This person did that. This person did this. We hinder their reputation. We, we damage their status. Absolutely not caring. Do we realize that through doing this, we are challenging God? Because God is trying to cover our sins, and we have the audacity to say, no, let me show them to the world. Do we understand this? Big transgression that we're performing. The concept of haya, you know how the Holy Prophet described it? خُلُقَ الْإِسْلَامِ الْحَيَاء The character, the ethics of Islam are built on modesty, on chastity. Haya is not limited to a woman wearing a hijab. Haya is how we deal with the creation and the creator. This is exactly what haya is, but you know what our youth say? YOLO. You only live once. Let me do whatever I want. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He puts these rules and covers our sins, He does it for a purpose. And amongst those reasons and justifications is to protect us. You see, when we commit sins and we expose them, we are threatening the modesty and the social shield of our community. We are desensitizing individuals when they see this person is doing the sin and exposing it and that person is, we become normal. It becomes a normality. And we want to, we slowly get engaged into performing the sin and viewing it as, you know, it's not a problem. This statement in Dua Kamil, we recite it every Thursday. Allahumma ghfir liya dhunub allati tahtikul isam. Oh Allah, Forgive those sins who tear apart your, your cover. I told you God is the most merciful. He wants to cover us. But there's times where we commit sins that He wants to expose us. You know what Imam Zain al abidin says? Amongst those sins is when we talk badly about one another. We expose our flaws. So this should show you how big of a deal it is when we expose one another. With this intro, I want our youth to understand that when we say we are Muslim, it's not about putting a line of a dua in our Instagram bio or tweeting a Quranic verse or putting a picture of an Islamic quote on Instagram. Islam, belief, faith is about having it in your heart and performing it in action. And hayat should be part of your DNA. Now, with this introduction, tonight as we honor the lady of Light. Say the Fatima al Zara alayhi salam, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made her a criterion for justice and truth because she's part of the Ahlul Bayt, who Allah commanded His Holy Prophet to say that as long as you hold tight to them, you will never go astray. She's part of that family. She is the daughter of the best human who stepped foot on this earth, and she's the daughter of Sayyidah Khadija, the mistress of the women of paradise. This is the lady that we're trying to honor. Allow me the honor to discuss her through the context of sitr, insha'Allah, through the following four points. Number one, how did we today do a great injustice to say the Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam? Number two, how did we misinterpret the concept of sitr that we prioritized culture over religion? And how are we, by doing this, Damaging our females specifically. Number three, youth empowerment. When are we going to uncover the untapped potential in our youth? And number four, Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, the symbol of modesty. Now, number one, how did we do a great level of injustice to say the Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam? Let me explain. In my humble opinion, we did that because we limited her greatness her persona, her status into her modesty and chastity and hijab only. You see, any time we're talking about hijab, the first thing that comes to mind is say the Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. And there is nothing wrong with that. Absolutely, she's a symbol of modesty. Absolutely, we need to take care of our modesty. But when we limit the greatness of 
Sayyida Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam, based on how she dealt with her physical appearance, we are doing a great injustice to her, her status and her position in our eyes. You see, if we examine the life of Sayyida Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam, we will notice that she was a blossom, she was a flower, she was young. But there is so many different dimensions and aspects that are breathtaking, that are life-changing, that are revolutionary in her life, in all dimensions, social, intellectual, spiritual, philosophical. And that's why if you limit her to just appearance, only the women will connect with her and we will just say Fatima Tazara is the role model for women. But no, she is the role model of men, women, Muslims, non-Muslims, humanity in its entirety. This is Sayyidah Fatima Tazara alayhi salam. What I'm trying to propose today is an, an option, a choice for us to rediscover, reassess the way we look at things through historical context. I'm going to give you an example. We all know the incident of Mubahala, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a verse in, in Surah Al-Imran, verse 61. He starts off, فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْا نَدْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ Come, let's bring our sons, your sons, our women, your women, our souls, your souls. Between brackets, God could have said, تَعَالُوا نَبْتَهِلْ Why did he emphasize? I'll let you figure that out. It's just to showcase the greatness of the Ahl al-Bayt. Unanimously across all Muslims, everyone agrees this verse came in honor of the Ahl al-Bayt Now, when the Muba'ala happened, the Holy Prophet was holding the hand of Imam Hassan on his, on his right hand. He was holding Imam Hussein. And behind him was Sayyidah Fatima Tazara alayhi salam. Behind her was Imam Ali alayhi salam. When we look at this, what do we say? Typically, MashaAllah, look, say the Fatima Tazara alayhi salam, the symbol, the icon of modesty. She's protecting her chastity, even her footsteps are not seen. 100%. But this is what I see today when I, when I read this. I see a supportive family placing the woman as the pillar, the center. She is filled with empowerment. She is filled with love, with compassion, that she does not need the attention, she does not need the encouragement, she does not need the love of any person behind. She is empowered from within, from her family, from her immediate circle. Why don't we look at things like that? Compare this circumstance with our woman today. See, and I'm being very honest, and I'm not restricting to the center, I'm talking generally how we are treating our woman, Muslim woman, across the globe. They, a lot of them lack self-esteem, they lack confidence, they lack love, they lack recognition because of the immediate family circle within them, because of their immediate uh, circle of family that they are not providing them with any support system. If there is, it's so weak that it's not even recognizable. So it's no surprise that they are shaken when they hear a, a kind word. You know, the woman is filled with emotions and we fail to understand that she is. So when things happen that require our females to step up, sometimes they're too shy, they can't even say a word. We forget the fact that Sayyidah Fatima Tazara alayhi salam, when her rights were, were deprived, she maintained her modesty, but she stood up and she fought. And the question is, why can't our women do the same? I'm not saying all of them, I'm saying majority because of us. Is it possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the female and made her the reason why her father enters heaven? And when she grows up to be a mother, she becomes a place where heaven lies under her feet for us to really recognize her like she is a, a, a creation of Allah who is just going to be performing housework. And Ush, you can't say anything. And I'm going to give you now examples of how we put culture before religion. Because what I'm trying to say is these misconceptions that I'm going to list, the outsiders, when they look at our societies, they say Islam is so oppressive to women. But the reality is everything that is happening is not what Islam teaches and advocates. It's what culture has been put forward before, you know, Islam. Let me share some knowledge. If you look at the literacy rates of Muslim women around the world, you will be embarrassed. 
And I want you to find me one verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands humans and says men seek knowledge, women can't. He always invites the human. He always invites the human. And one of the names of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra is Al-Alima. She's the, the scholar. She's the learner. Haven't we pondered that Hadith al-Kisa was narrated by who? An Jabir ibn Abdullah and Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra. Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra taught some of the companions. <laughs> we don't know this. So where in Islam does it say women can seek knowledge? Number two, forced marriage. I'm sorry, but there are still places in this world where the females have been deprived the right to say no to someone who proposes it to them. It's been presented to us that part of the obedience of parents is to accept whoever comes and asks for their hand and the parents say yes and that's it. When, there's nowhere in Islam that says women have to say yes to whatever their parents say in regards to marriage. That's not obedience, that's infringement of rights. The woman has the right to say no if she doesn't see that it's fitting. So where in Islam does it say that women can't? Number three, not working. Is it possible that God created us, the human being, as a successor to this world? He entrusted us in this world for us to enrich society, for us to serve humanity. And through doing that, he said, you know what, the woman, you're not part of the society, just stay home. And you cannot work. Where in Islam does it say that? I'm not proposing that women can't be housewives and that's not a noble job. It's actually absolutely difficult. I'm saying give the woman the option to decide if they want to work or not, if they want to enrich society or not. Because they can enrich society. Obviously, we need them in society. They are the foundation of society. If you don't empower women, your society will be weak. And outsiders don't know, but do you know that the house, the woman will love this, performing housework for your husband is not compulsory in Islam. It's part of good manners and ethics, but the woman, it's, she's not forced to serve the man. They're so happy right now. So all these are examples. And when God revealed the concept of hijab, of the woman and the man and modesty, he didn't introduce it so he can isolate women from men and say, women, stay home, and men, come work. No, he did that to facilitate the interaction, drawing the boundaries to ensure that when the interaction happens, it's respectful, it's dignified. That's the purpose. But when you come to you know, our societies, it's like we are exactly in the age of you know, ignorance. This is what we found our parents to perform. So we can't change it. Culture before religion. We fail to understand that the Holy Prophet himself tried to change the sickening culture through Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. We don't read in history and see the way that he treated her. He would welcome her, you know, rush to her, greeting, kiss her, show her so much love. Utilize any opportunity to express her greatness, to showcase his love for her. In a time where the woman, the daughter, the girl used to be buried alive, and society would not even kiss their children, the Prophet tried to change this norms through Fatima al-Zahra. And when he did that, in return, say the Fatima al-Zahra, that young little girl, receiving all this love and empowerment, she, what, what was her nickname? Ummu Abiha, the mother of her father. All this love was reflected back to the Holy Prophet. The Holy Prophet sought comfort and soothness through her. So this is a proof that even a small little daughter, she can give you, the man, what you cannot ever have. But remember the way you treat her. Now I'm going to talk about women empowerment. And you know, in my humble eyes, this starts not when they're old. This starts when they're young. So I'm going to now enter the discussion of upbringing. And now I'm going to open the circle and welcome the boys and talk about youth in general. Our beloved parents have every right to talk about this. And they keep emphasizing, and we obviously cannot disagree. 
about their position, their status, and how important it is to obey them, and what's, what are their rights upon us. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we owe everything to our parents. No doubt about it. But today I'm going to shift the perspective and, and say what are the rights of children upon their parents. Something that Imam Zain al-Abideen talked about in Risalat al-Hukuq, in his series of letters that I advise all of us to, to reflect on. You see, a fundamental right for every single kid is for them to receive education from their parents through which they can be directed to having good mannerism and more importantly, be directly to understanding the existence of God, obeying Him, and seeking closeness to Him. This is a fundamental right every kid has to their parents. i am humbly been serving in the Sunday school. So I have a tiny experience that I can use to reflect my, what I see here and elsewhere. I tell you, in our societies, our kids are lacking love, are lacking interaction, are lacking recognition by their parents. And I'm sorry, dear parents, you might not ag agree with me completely, but I'm going to prove it to you. You see, when Imam Ali salam, was struck by the sword in the night of destiny, and he was walking back to his house, he wasn't able to walk. But before he entered the house, he stood up. And they asked him why. He said, I don't want to break the heart of Zainab salam. This is the love that the Imams had for their children. But today, the babysitter of children is none other than the iPhone, than the, the tablet. This is exactly what happens. The parents and the kids are completely isolated. And I promise you, parents, that you have no idea who your kids are online. You have absolutely no idea who they are, who they're interacting with, what they're seeing. Because you've isolated them completely and you thought that the iPhone will raise them, will raise a good generation of kids. So what happens? These kids, they receive absolutely no interaction with their parents. They have no idea where, where they are. They have no understanding of their identity as Muslims. They grow up 12, 13 years old. I swear to God, some kids, they don't know to say, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or alayhi salam. They still do not know how to, with all due respect, how to use the washroom with tahara. They're 13, 14 years old. Who's responsible for that? What are our parents doing in their homes? Do you think that if you bring your kids to Sunday school for two, three hours, that we're going to change them? We cannot do that in two hours in an entire week. They go to school, they interact with others. Where is the dialogue? And you have to understand that we live in different times. Goodbye to the times where you tell your kids, do this or else you go to hell. Goodbye to those times. The kids now question. I have kids that I teach, four years old, five years old. They ask me questions about the God and proving his existence and the justice of God that I would never think of being 26 years old. Don't underestimate the intellect of your kids. What's wrong with you interacting with them? Now, what happens is these kids grow slowly. They become teenagers. Then they deviate. And then the parents start crying. Why did my uh, boy go to this wrong crowd? Why can't my girl wear the hijab? Why are they too embarrassed to say they are Muslim? Why has he nicknamed himself as Mo? Because he is not proud enough to say Muhammad. Because you fail to spend enough time to empower him, to enrich him, to enrich his culture and understanding and values as a Muslim. So it's no surprise that if you don't invest, you're not going to get the returns. You all understand financial terms, right? If you don't invest, you're not going to get any return. In addition to that, this is the role of the parents. There is the role of our societies too. And this is where I'm going to come across and tie it to the concept of sitr. You see, our youth, like all of us, are not angels. We commit sin. But a lot of us are, are striving to improve themselves. You see a sister, her hijab is not perfect. Okay? Fine. She's taking the steps. You see a, a, a boy, a guy, he's with the wrong crowd of people in the wrong environment. But he has it within him. He can, you can bring him back. 
instead of welcoming them, supporting them, we push them away and we close the door. When the Islamic centers are built to attract such people, when our duty and obligation is to take these people by the hand, offer them the support, the education, the patience, and see how they change. But we don't do this. We rush into, oh my goodness, backbiting. It's, it's the favorite hobby of 90% of the people. Belittling them, oh, did you see this? Did you see that? How can these people, these youth who are trying their best, stick to a society when all they receive is negativity back? Think of this. There is a person who claimed to be a god. Pharaoh. Is there a bigger problem than this? What does God tell his prophet Musa? How should you talk to this person? Speak with him gently. Speak to them with compassion. That's a person who claims to be God. What about our youth? Do we acknowledge the way that we rush into bashing them? We tear them apart with our words. And we forget that the tongue is a sword. And look around you and see how many people stopped coming to our centers and dig into the reasons. And you will find the answer. We have to understand that the centers, the Islamic centers, are not a place for us to, to plant the seeds of poison, division, and disunity. It's a place for soul purification, for mind enlightenment. It's a, it's a place where we stimulate unity. The Holy Prophet expresses and describes the Muslims as one family. When we are acting the furthest of what a family should be. Understand that we need, for the sake of the Prophet, for the sake of the daughter of the Prophet, whom we are honoring tonight, understand that we really need to embrace one another. We need to be patient. We need to be lenient. We need to be kind. We need to take it easy on our youth and on all individuals. Now, I've defended the youth a lot now, right? But let me also talk to the youth a little bit and tell you this. It's not an excuse because you're not receiving enough support that you deviate. Why? Because number one, God gave you the intellect, the mind, the fitra for you to distinguish between what's right or wrong. Don't shift the blame to others. You have vision through which you can see what's right or wrong. That's number one. Number two, Look at history. Look at your role models. Every single role model of yours. You will realize one thing in common. The path of truth is never easy. <laughs> it's always going to be filled with difficulties. So why do you think that the, the pathway for you to receive guidance is going to be filled with flowers? And what's wrong with you taking the inspiration from the source directly? Why do you need to be enslaved to intermediaries? If you put more intermediaries, you're going to weaken the connection anyway. Go directly to God. Go directly to the Ahlul Bayt, Connect with them, and you'll see all guidance, and you'll see all inspiration. And look at the Holy Quran. What kind of example he gives us? For a female who did not have the most healthy of, of, of surroundings, but she still strived, that we still honor her today. وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا See, لَذِينَ آمَنُوا all of the believers, not men, not women, who? Mra'at Fir'aun, the wife of the Pharaoh. Go read about her story. See how she was treated. She was a mistress filled with mansions, thousands of servants. Her husband claims to be God. Well, tell me what worse environment can you be in? But she still gave up all of this and she had one request. I see closeness to you, God. I don't want this. I'll fight for your sake. <laughs> she didn't receive any support. How did she strive? We can do it too. Do not limit your capabilities. Do not think that you cannot change the world. Wallah, you can. See my wallah? Wallah, you can. Trust me, you can. I promise you, all of you can be torches of guidance for people around you. Don't think that I can't. And what's more important is it's not about how long you lived. It's about what you have accomplished in your life. Because the lady we're honoring tonight 
if you look at all narrations, she's between the age of 18, 25, 26 max. But in this short time frame, she was elevated to the status of being the best woman who ever stepped foot in this world from its existence to this very day. How many billions of, upon billions of, of women? She only needed 18 years to, to confirm her greatness. So don't say that, oh, I don't have time. Oh, I'm a youth. I can't do something. Wallah, you can. I've talked a lot, so I'm going to wrap things up with this. Fatima Tazar is a symbol of sitr. She's concealed. She's covered. Imam al-Baqir describes one of the reasons why she was named Fatima. Why? Because in al khalqa qad futimu an ma'rifatiha. The creation will never understand and fully comprehend who say the Fatima Tazar is. That's a fact. We will never. We can talk here for ages. We will never understand her greatness ever. And only on judgment day we will see her greatness. God hidden so much knowledge, caliber, status in her. And she's truly a, a sign, a symbol of sitr, of, of covering. Not only in her modesty and chastity, but also in a lot of things. In her sadness and sorrows. Her sadness and sorrows are covered. We do not know the pains that she went through the moment her beloved father died until she joined him in the heavens. What else? The, the night that she was buried, she was covered by the darkness of the night. She was covered by the darkness of the casket, of the, of the coffin. She was the first female Muslim to be buried in a coffin. And she was covered by being in a place that we do not know where it is until this very day. All these coverings, we do not know her. We do not know the grief, the sorrow, the status. She's unknown. She's the secret one. This is Fatima Tazar The flower has been crushed and her fragments is mixed with her blood. And I just want you to imagine a loved one of yours. And how can you have the power to go and bury them and bid them farewell and walk away? And it's not any two people. It's Ali and Fatima. God knows how Imam Ali السلام, had the patience to pray her and bid her farewell and go away. And God knows how it was to walk back to that house and see Hassan, see Hussein, see Zainab waiting. Their dad is alone. There's no mother anymore. Kids. This is the lady that we are honoring tonight for her sake, for all the troubles, the difficulties that she went through. Honor her not by words, honor her through your interactions. And tonight I want you to go home, tell your kids that you love them. Interact with your family members. Do not belittle your youth, respect your women. And through that, you will bring some comfort to the hearts of your holy prophet, his successor Imam Ali, and the mistress of the women of paradise, say the Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. With that, I thank you all for listening to me. May Allah bless you all, and I'm really sorry for taking too long. Hada wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi tayyibina tahirin.